Record button has been hit. That means we're live for another episode of the Ringside Nutrition Podcast. My guest today is a chap called Danny Lennon. Danny, thank you so much for giving up your time to come on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for asking me, Jack. Pleasure to chat today. I'm looking forward to it. So for the, for the guys that don't know much about you, Danny, uh, do you want to give a quick kind of like overview of who you are and what you do and sort of like your background in combat sports nutrition? Sure. So I think probably the most relevant things to today's discussion, my background is a, a master's degree in nutritional sciences um, and I have an undergrad degree in biology and physics. And through my time after finishing my master's and getting into nutrition consultancy, ended up working with a variety of different athletes. And through a combination of some contacts that I had and the fact that I was also involved uh, myself training in MMA gyms. I was doing quite a lot of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and uh, dabbling a small bit in, in some MMA now and again. But I had quite a few friends in that area. Eventually started working with some uh, fighters over here in, in Ireland and a couple of them ended up being quite uh, high profile, at, at least on the national scene. And through that work, um, through word of mouth, essentially started working with more and more combat athletes specifically and started to see a lot of the specific needs that they have and ended up um, not only getting to work with a lot of them, trying to put my philosophy and the things that I learned into a written format that other people that weren't working with me could hopefully get access to and ended up putting out a book, a digital book in 2017, I think it was now. Um, and so that probably is a lot relevant to what we're probably going to discuss today in relation to combat sports. Outside of that, I run a company called Sigma Nutrition, which is aimed at putting out evidence-based information on nutrition as it pertains to both health and performance. And that's mainly done through the podcast Sigma Nutrition Radio, but I also am quite lucky to do a lot of lecturing and speaking at conferences and doing seminars and so on. And yeah, so there's this nice balance between content creation, which is what I primarily, primarily do now. And then um, in the past, having worked with a number of, of athletes on helping them make weight. And right now, Sigma as a company, we, we work with a lot of weight class based athletes, even outside of combat sports. So for example, there's a lot of powerlifters here uh, on the, at a national and international level that we currently work with. And so just trying to help people who are making weight and want to perform do so in the most effective way possible. Um, and so, yeah, that's a few things that may be relevant to today, but I'm happy to just discuss any specifics if you wish. Yeah, and that, that's kind of like one of the things which I kind of like have huge admiration for you for is that kind of like education of, of all athletes um, and really prioritizing that education as, you know, a top priority in the work that you do. Um, and one of the things I want to sort of got you on to talk about today, Danny, is Kind of like I know from afar that your sort of philosophy and your process of working with combat sports athletes is you do make like an emphasis of what we want to talk about today is the 52 week fight camp, don't you? And how mm. fighters almost need to pay attention to their nutrition, not just when it matters in an eight to 10 week fight camp. They now, I guess, fighters need to be paying attention to their nutrition year round, just like they would do with their training. Do you want to discuss a bit about how, you know, you set things up and your sort of approach with that? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think this is something that many fighters themselves will have, will have thought about, or no doubt have seen examples on either extreme of, we can think of classic examples in the past of uh, even elite level professional athletes that would, after a fight is over, get out of shape, like go partying for months on end, not really train, not really pay attention to nutrition, um, and then come back really out of shape and have to go through that process again of getting back in fight shape. Um, and there's some drawbacks in the immediate term in terms of the struggle of getting back to weight, but also in the long term of what that does to you and how more difficult it becomes each time, particularly as someone's career progresses, never mind some of the health consequences. And then you have other athletes who just stay in good condition year round. Now, that doesn't mean stay close to their fighting weight. Of course, I think nearly every combat sport athlete should be walking around at a higher weight most of the year than they are going to weigh in at, and even in the weeks leading up to a fight, what weight they're going to be. Um, but staying in a place where they're not too far away from it. And I think the benefits is not only 
you're avoiding putting yourself through this massive dieting phase over and over again. But probably what's more immediately um, obvious to a lot of fighters is that if an opportunity to take a fight on short notice comes up, they can do so, and they can do so without majorly undermining their performance. And this has become more and more relevant as we see the big organizations are <clears throat> obviously keen not to completely scratch fights from their card if someone drops out to put a replacement in. And then you never know what opportunity that can lead to. Um, and nearly all fighters are willing to, to take that. So there's benefits to doing so. I, I think classic examples used to give people of the kind of yo-yoing in and out of uh, fight ready shape was uh, maybe what people would associate with like what Ricky Hatton often used to do where he would be like super shredded and really good physical condition for his fights but then would just enjoy himself quite a bit afterwards yeah, no in between was there it was quite a bit, no. all or nothing and I mean there's a certain part that that's that's quite endearing about his, his character but we will never know of course would there have been any difference if he had conducted himself like someone like a Bernard Hopkins where we look at where he, there's obviously a genetic element to that, but there's also a, a mindset of I'm staying in good shape all the time for years on end. So I, I think right now, for those reasons, it's clear that having some focus on nutrition year round is a good idea. That doesn't mean dieting year round. That doesn't mean having to be super strict in the same way you would during a fight camp. Of course, you can be relaxed. Of course, you can go away on holidays and so on. But having some attention and planning to uh, the period of time. So I used to think of this like in a four phase model that's now became a five phase model uh, that we can maybe explore each of those aspects. But uh, those five phases being one, we look at what are the, like, the general baseline nutrition requirements for an athlete in terms of how do you fuel your training? So you don't have a fight coming up. How do you fuel your training? How do you recover from that? How do you make sure you're getting the appropriate adaptations? From that, the that's, that's a really, sorry to interrupt there, Danny, but that's a really important yeah. point because out of camp, the guys will be training, right? So they're, they're still going to be training. They're still going to be doing like strength and conditioning sessions, maybe once a week instead of twice. They may be running, doing boxing or MMA on the mats and stuff. But all of the focus on nutrition, you've just said there, the nutrition fuels that and recovers from, helps them recover from their training. So neglecting the nutrition kind of outside of camp, but training at the same time is almost kind of counterproductive, right? Yes. And, and I think it, it stems from a, a mindset that's easy for people to fall into of associating nutrition with making weight, right? The only reason I'm a nutritionist is to make sure that I weigh in at the weight I need to, to make sure I can go through the fight camp, uh, diet down, make weight, and then rehydrate for my fight, as opposed to the other benefits that you're going to get from nutrition outside of that. So when you don't have a fight coming up, making sure that all your training sessions you can do at the best of your ability because you're appropriately fueled, that you're recovering between those sessions, that you, if you're doing gym work and you want to have certain adaptations at the muscle, that you are providing yourself with the nutrients to do so. Um, never mind some of the health aspects where you're improving your ability to uh, be more resilient to illness and injury and therefore if you're doing that you're making more training sessions and if you stack that up over many months and many years of a career how many extra good quality training sessions you got could have some impact on uh, technical ability and so on so i think yeah realizing that there's much more of an impact that nutrition can have apart from making weight and we, we try and talk to the athletes about the goal of working with a nutritionist or get working on some particular type of nutrition goal isn't to make weight. That's like some aspect of it. That's a requirement for sure. But the goal is for you to be able to win fights and trying to divorce the goal from simply making weight because it's easy to get someone to make weight um, in ways that are not good for them. And that will leave them feeling drained and unable to perform. So that's why you see so many like charlatans in the business now that get people doing massive weight cuts um, mm -hmm. as if it's some sign of success, but the athletes don't feel good and aren't performing well. So yeah, it's, it's like the guys say like, oh, I make weight easily. Um, but it's not, it's not about whether you don't get a medal for, for making weight, you get a medal or a title for, for performing or winning on fight night. So if you're going to make weight, and I guess that that's a good segue, Danny, to talking about kind of like what, are the negatives of neglecting or not being on top of your nutrition uh, outside of fight cap? What is that 
what are the ramifications going to be when it then comes around to the start of the next fight camp? How is that going to affect the fighter? Yeah. So, and this is where, where the, the key of, of having those kind of set phases of our baseline and nutrition of how we want to fuel year round. And then that moves into phase two of that diet or what people refer to as the fight camp. So it could be eight weeks, 10 weeks, six weeks, depending on when someone gets notice of when their next fight is that period of time that we associate with a fight camp, you'll have a slight change in your goal with your nutrition. Phase three would be the acute weight cut the week of the fight, let's say. Phase four would be the refuel before you actually fight. And then phase five is that kind of recovery period after fighting before you get back into full on, on training again. So thinking about it in, in that sense, if you are staying, let's say, a small bit leaner uh, year round, uh, that you're paying more attention to your nutrition, that you're building better habits year round, then when you do have a fight coming up, let's say in eight weeks time, you have a fight now scheduled, you're going to start your fight camp. Now you're going to start focusing on your, your diet to gradually start bringing down your body fat levels. <clears throat> Two things will have happened. One, you're now closer to the weight you need to diet down to. So therefore, over the next eight weeks, the rate at which you drop weight can be a bit slower. So how aggressive your calorie deficit needs to be, the diet is going to be less. And therefore, you can essentially have more calories in your diet to fuel training and recovery. So yes, you're probably still going to try and get a bit leaner and, and diet down over those number of weeks. But doing so at a rate of, let's say, if it's like 0 0.4, 0 0.5 of a kilo is very different from someone that leaves themselves with so much weight to drop that they're trying to lose a kilo a week. They can barely eat any food. And now their training is going to be terrible in the period of time where you'd ideally want to be able to put your most intensity into training. That's like so, 500 calories more a day. So that's like they could potentially have another meal a day in fight camp when they're a bit groggy and a bit tired if they pay a little bit more attention to their nutrition um, outside of camp, yeah? Uh, absolutely. So it's just giving themselves so much to do that you have to restrict more. Then it also just makes the diet more difficult because you have to have more uh, decrease in your food options and what you can consume. So your performance is going to go down. Your recovery is going to go down. The difficulty of sticking to the diet is going to increase. And then the second part of it, if you are now, if you don't pay any attention to your nutrition year round, and then suddenly you have a fight in six weeks, now you start working with a nutritionist, but suddenly you have to start changing all these nutrition habits. Okay. I've, I've got these certain targets I want to meet with my diet, but how do I put these together? What does a good quality meal look like? What does a meal with a sufficient amount of protein look like? Uh, how do I do, fit this into my typical schedule and in around training? All these logistical things that you haven't been paying attention to now are an extra added uh, stress or a, a detail that you have to pay attention to that you could have been working on building into your diet or in, into your schedule. So year round, if you build those necessary nutrition habits, then when it comes to the actual dieting down and reducing your intake, you're basically keeping the exact same habits the way you always eat, but just with a bit less food. And so there's a lot less psychologically going on as well. So I think those two key reasons are what makes working on your nutrition year round uh, the best approach as opposed to thinking of it as in small blocks of time when I have a fight coming up. I think that's such an important point, Danny. It's really good you said that. And I've seen it myself with guys that, that almost, like you said, there were the nutrition habits thing and they may be outside of camp working on those and having maybe hitting their daily hydration target and having three liters of fluid, or they might be having a higher carbohydrate meal before they train in the evening. And then they just take that and then they just apply it into the fight camp. Whereas you can almost waste a couple of weeks um, with a new fighter. If they come to you at the start of a fight camp, just wasting that time trying to figure out and trying to instill them habits. Whereas it's kind of like a rolling train just come straight through and you're just straight into the, into the fight camp of all guns blazing. So, yeah, so that's a really yeah. important point. Yeah. I've tried to teach guys that it's think of it in the same way as any skill acquisition, that there's a skill involved in getting good at your nutrition per se. Right. And there's all these skills to acquire and habits to build. And so the same way that they would think of any other technical aspect that they want to pay attention to working on it year round makes them more skillful in this art of, eating appropriately, knowing when to get their meals in, eating a sufficient amount of protein, making sure meals are prepared ahead of time, making sure the supplements they want to take are, are used correctly and so on. But these are all skills that take education and then practice. And the more you practice them, then the better you're going to be and the less you have to think about it when you have a fight coming up. So you can focus on the things you actually care about versus, as you say, if someone leaves it too late, 
there's so many things now to think about and to learn essentially how to do for the first time. It's just adding to an already stressful period of time. Yeah. Whilst they've got a lot of stuff, cognitive load going on with things that they want to do in training or visualizing how, when they're going to fight their opponent, it's just an added stressor, isn't it? Which they could have ticked off um, in their downtime kind of outside of camp. And that's really, Mm, that's really important. One thing I also want to want to, touch on Danny is almost talking about should fighters outside of camp stick to a calorie deficit or should they in some way almost get above their body's kind of set point and almost go into a little bit of a surplus where's kind of like you said about Ricky Hatton and going to the extreme and putting on loads of weight should fighters be putting on a bit of weight actually outside of camp but just be a bit more kind of strategic about it so I think in the immediate aftermath of a fight being over over those next couple of weeks, there is going to be some weight gain, including some gain of body fat. And I think that is going to be completely normal. By the, the time they've fought, in most cases, particularly the lower you go in weight classes, the athlete would have dieted down to very lean levels uh, that are probably not neither sustainable nor actually beneficial to try and remain at year round. And so they can probably perform their best and recover their best in training when they don't have a fight coming up at a slightly higher body fat level. However, that's not uh, like the aim to go and just gain as much body fat and it doesn't matter. It's just slightly higher than they want. So really what you're aiming for is there's going to be a bit of weight gain after that fight. You also want to give psychologically a break from some of that structure for the week or two afterwards without going crazy. So a proper plan where they can maybe enjoy some meals out with, with a spouse or friends and so on, but also have some good uh, habits still in place. There's going to be some gain of body weight back, uh, some gain of body fat back in that period of time. And then you want to have probably, I would just say, maintenance uh, intake for many months on end. So there's no need to force a surplus, but you probably certainly don't want another deficit. Um, You want to be able to eat as much as the athlete needs to maintain their current amount of weight. Um, so the more their calories can push up and still support their training and their weight stay in around the same, that's the goal. Now, if there is a lot of restraint required in order to eat a certain level of calories, then it's probably the target is too low that they want to have a higher intake. So it should be an amount that is easy to do, that they're not hungry at all, that they can sustain their training demands appropriately and that their weight is staying relatively stable after, say, that first couple of weeks where there will be some gain in body weight back. And I think intuitively the athlete and the nutritionist will know like what level of body fat this athlete just feels their best on. So psychologically, they have good mood most days. But they feel really good in training. They feel really strong. What is that normal walk around body weight they feel good at? And then kind of maintain that over time um, and then work back from there of, okay, depending on what weight class I'm in, that means I'll need to diet this many kilos in order to make weight for my next fight. And then make sure you leave a long enough period of time to gradually diet down to that um, in most normal circumstances, unless it's something crazy like a last minute fight per se. So uh, I think that's the way I would typically do it. No need to force a surplus, but I would certainly try and eat as many calories as that athlete needs to just feel good and perform well. Yeah, so it's, it's obviously like you, you wouldn't want them in a, in, a, in a deficit any further outside of the camp. You'd almost kind of want them to go and enjoy their time, which they deserve. And they need to have that time with their family or their friends where they can go on holiday and, and have some food. But it's like when they get back, perhaps just say like, this is going to be your everyday diet and focus more on try and get the basics right, such as the calorie target and having three, four meals a day. And before then tightening the screws when it comes around to fight camp again again yeah yeah and uh, and athletes will kind of know that kind of level where uh before they start dieting for a fight there's a there's a, to the point where they do feel very strong and they're maybe a bit more resilient to injury and illness as well and everything just think feels really good that maybe after they diet and they're just about to compete is, is a bit of a drop from that right but they just need to do it in order to make weight so getting back up to that level is probably where i'd aim that every day they feel good and they're a bit more resilient to injury and, and illness and they're able to take, like anecdotally, guys feel like they can take better shots in sparring at a certain body weight versus as they diet down, there's a bit more susceptibility to that. 
Mm. And then what about something I've done with some guys outside of camp is using that time productively. Almost we were chatting off air, weren't we, about sort of using you know the coronavirus and the lockdown thing to practice or put into place, spend time on projects and stuff that you wouldn't have time to do normally. Trialing acute weight cuts, would that be something that you would sort of advocate or, or do with some of your guys and trialing acute weight mm. cuts, so sort of replicating fight week and then using that time wisely? Yeah, I think if there's a sufficient amount of time that the athlete has and they know they're not going to be uh, competing anytime soon, um, then it can be really useful to, to trial a specific type of protocol, particularly if they've never used it before. Um, or if they are considering, let's say, going to a new weight class that would require a bigger weight cut from them, trialing that and just seeing how they feel. So number one, can they actually physically drop that amount in uh, to a week time frame with the acute protocol that they've put out and then number two after they've kind of refueled when they come into the the gym maybe the next day and they're working on the pads or the bag or doing some some light sparring or something how do they generally feel do they feel like completely drained or like oh this is actually pretty good like i feel how i normally feel going into a, a fight um barring of course the, ex the exception of like the adrenaline and stuff that would kick in yeah so i I, yeah, I, I think if there is enough time and they're definitely not going to have a, a fight coming up soon, there may be a benefit to doing that, given that it's nothing too extreme. I think with very large weight cuts, ideally you want to avoid them at all if you can. For those athletes that do typically use large weight cuts and that risk reward they feel is worth it, then you probably don't want to be adding in extra really big weight cuts, but you can try some of it, let's say. So you, you don't do the dieting phase but instead you just do the last four or five days of a weight cut because you're trialing what the water restriction loading might look like. And you're going to play around and try something new um, and just see if you get a different response um, or how much of a drop you notice. Um, so I think there's a, a big um, benefit to, to doing that, especially if it's something the athlete hasn't done before. Yeah. And I spoke to Carl about that in the first episode and said about how he has had to have the experience of some guys doing an acute dehydration phase and just some of them, you know, having a high sweat rate and you could put them in um, a hot room or something or get them sat outside in the sun and they would just sweat it out. But there'd be some people that just didn't give up the water. So if you were to almost to just go into the fight camp and just go into fight, we can say, okay, we're going to lose 1% of, of your weight or 1.5% of your weight through acute dehydration. But then that person then doesn't, you know, sweat a lot or give up the water. You're then in a tricky situation where you're kind of like kicking yourself and thinking we could have trialed that couldn't we sort of 10 right. weeks ago <laughs> yeah and that's it and there's just logistical things whether whether guys usually use maybe a, a hot bath or something like that um and if they haven't done that before just knowing okay what is the time cost for this specific individual when they go at this certain temperature and do this many minutes and this type of protocol what does that trajectory of how long does it take to do that and then you can plan ahead for then your next fights of, okay, when do we need to start that process? We don't want to start too early or too late. And so you can just do logistical things like that a bit better once you have some data that's specific to this individual as opposed to guesswork, I guess. Just gives them that assurance and kind of like an analogy I used, it's like driving somewhere new that you've never been to for the first time. And you might have to pull over and like get your phone out and look on maps and find out where it is exactly. And you took a wrong turn. But if you'd already been there ahead of time, you probably remember where you're going, wouldn't you? So it's kind of thinking that's of it that way. Yeah, there, there's a comfort to knowing, okay, I've done this before. I'm familiar with a certain process. So um, yeah, good, good to do those things ahead of time. <laughs> um, and kind of like, how do fighters actually go about doing this then, Danny? How do they actually go about managing their nutrition out of camp? Obviously, like work with work with a nutritionist, maybe not so much as you would do in camp. Um, but how could they potentially have the tools to manage their nutrition on their own? Would you recommend like tracking their food intake or um, using like recipes and stuff? What, what sort of stuff could the guys listening do outside of camp? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question because I'm, I'm very cognizant that they're, it's very resource intensive to work with um, performance nutritionists, particularly when that's doing a good job. And it may not be feasible for a lot of athletes to do that um, year round on a, on a very intense one-to-one -one every week period, but they may set up something where they're able to touch base with them every few weeks or every month or something like that. And with some more hands-off contact, but they just be able to touch base with them. That might be a useful way to go. If they're managing it themselves, then it's all about taking the things that you 
are learning from uh, your nutritionist or coach and seeing how can I just translate this into an ongoing uh, set of habits. So with things like tracking intake, there may not be a need for them to track militantly and very strictly, even though they might choose to do that in the lead up to a fight, because as a benefit of accuracy, you can be sure of what you're taking in, making sure it's appropriate to get you to the weight you need, but you probably don't need to do it year round. And there's certainly benefits to not having to pay that level of, of attention to your diet. Um, I think psychologically and just not being so reliant on it is good. So they can take about, think about, okay, what is a typical day look like in terms of meals? Um, maybe collect certain recipes that they particularly enjoy that they know are going to hit certain targets for them. Okay, so I'm going to pick these main meals, all have a minimum level of protein that I usually aim for. I get an idea of what portion size is appropriate for them and their training. Build up a essentially their own little archive of meals they enjoy. And then I think putting in place a structure is probably one of the most important things. Uh, when structure goes out the window and people are eating more sporadically, it's very difficult to get a gauge of if they're eating an appropriate amount or not, versus if they know, okay, on my training days, I'm going to have this same meal frequency all the times. This is where I'm typically going to eat. And then all you're doing is just plugging in different types of meals that you can change between the ingredients. And then noticing what allows that person to be satisfied with intake. So as I said, during that year round phase, they probably shouldn't be going around hungry all the time. Like they maybe are gonna be closer to the fight. So they should be satisfied from the meals, eating plenty and their training performance should be good. And then they can play around with if they need to increase or decrease uh, those, those, those portions. So I, I think it's, taking some of maybe the extreme things we do close to fight and then dialing back more and more over time to what would be um, just general habits of knowing this is how I structure a good quality meal. This is typically the times of day I'm usually going to eat and then knowing how to keep that going. So it depends on where someone's uh, current level of knowledge is and how long they've been doing certain things. Uh, but I think that's the ultimate goal. In the short term, they can use something like tracking intake or keeping a food diary or so on to see where their baseline is at. And if they're doing that consistently and the things are relatively similar all the time, then they can start tracking less and less and less and just going more on, okay, this is what I typically eat a day and kind of trusting themselves and then eating to hunger and then judging their performance um, in training kind of subjectively. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree completely. And I almost think as well, like in, in camp is where they want to be doing the intensive tracking, if that's what they choose to do or the meal prep kind of stuff. I think out of camp, it just kind of needs to be, this is a good meal to have for breakfast on a rest day. This is a good meal to have if I'm going to train in three hours time. Um, I should probably cut a few of these things out and I'm going to allow myself to have this meal out with my family on Saturday afternoon and not feel guilty about it. It's right. making the right decisions um, at the right time and almost taking that that kind of light switch approach, which I've heard before of the pole, you don't turn the light off, you just dim it down a bit um, and just ramp it back up when you get back to, to getting into a training camp. The, the light doesn't turn off, yeah. the nutrition doesn't switch off um, outside of camp. So no, I think that's a really useful point you made there, Danny. Yeah, and, and that's the exact way we would try and do it. Have general good nutrition habits for eating good quality food most of the time, but not necessarily very strict rules. And then making sure you're eat, eating an appropriate amount overall. And then when you do have that fight coming up where you kind of dial that in and tighten things up, you may decide to track or you may not, but you are just going to tighten things up. So it's a bit more accurate that you know exactly what you're eating. You're going to be a bit hungrier when you're dieting and so on. But the overall diet pattern and the foods you're picking are going to look very similar to probably the year round period with a few small changes. Mm. And you also said about there as well about checking in weekly and stuff with a nutritionist um that's not probably what people want to be doing is it kind of outside of camp they just need that kind of person in the background they know they're kind of there they know they're watching yes. over them and they're being accountable but they're not just in their face um which they might be sort of in in camp daily or weekly so uh, yeah I yeah that, that yeah could be i think a really useful yeah. service yeah and i think there's a benefit to people having that like even like a seeing it as like a retainer that person's there if i need to shoot them a question but they're not going to be badgering me for certain things or not checking like body fats or, or things closer to the fight that they can relax 
and, and just have that someone there if they need to. And I think that's good because it, it gives the athlete more autonomy. It's not a nutritionist dictating to you, this is how you eat and how you live your life. It's like, you're in charge. This is your career. Eat how you wish. But if you need some help or have a question or well, some input, then you can reach out in this certain time or this so often or mm. just check to see how you're doing. And I think that's probably a really good strategy that gives kind of the best of, of both worlds. In that sense. Even, even just like like this, what we're doing now, um, obviously for the listeners, this is going to be on a podcast, but we're on a video call right now. It's almost like jumping on Zoom, having a video call with the athlete or the fighter for half an hour, 40 minutes, maybe looking at a food diary that they've written for a couple of days and saying, yeah, okay, well, I would recommend that you make these changes. Here's some recipes and then checking in in another couple of weeks. Um, I mm. think that is that in itself as a service, particularly at the moment we're in, um, with guys out, a lot of people out of camp, but still training, waiting for opportunities. It might be a good idea for people like ourselves to be more kind of easily accessible instead of them signing up for 500 pound coaching services, which have a minimum right. of 12 weeks yeah. or something. Do you know what I mean? I, I agree. And, and like you say, I think that specifically right now, when there's so much uncertainty for, for guys like, when am I going to be able to fight again? Right. I don't know if my, my organization has a certain, event planned for this date but we don't know if that's going to go ahead or not is, is that country going to go into another lockdown is it going to be called off is someone on the card going to uh, test positive and then my fight's going to be scratched all these things are in place where they maybe can't to okay i'm definitely going to be competing on this certain date in the future and then therefore i can guarantee that i'm going to have the, the money and the resources to put towards this and also just the investment um in knowing that this is going to go ahead so uh yeah i think that more flexible approach is going to be particularly suitable right now yeah and with your kind of like experiences with working directly with fighters obviously it's quite hard to gauge but do you think that the guys that do pay attention to the nutrition year round actually end up performing better than the guys who don't or do you think it's just one of those ones where it is just you know luck of the draw and talent and stuff yeah so i think we have to be very careful of um i, I definitely don't want to oversell what nutrition does for athletes, right? Uh, particularly in MMA where there's so many factors uh, and boxing is the exact same that go into who is gonna win a fight. Um, some of that is gonna be skill. Some of it's gonna be conditioning. Some of it's gonna be their preparation. Some of it's gonna be luck. Um, and so oftentimes the outcome of a fight is completely divorced from any of those things. So um, certainly there are factors that matter more um, I, would, I would say then getting every specific thing right with your nutrition all the time. That said, uh, anecdotally at least, I do think there is a correlation between the athletes who have been, that, that I got to work with for the longest period of time, who checked in the most and stayed like working or touching base at least with me consistently all the time. Um, I had a couple of great examples of guys I worked with for maybe four years that pretty much was constant contact even if that was just a touch base when they don't have a fight coming up every few weeks um, or they'd update me on this is what i'm doing all's going good i don't need any advice but this is how things have been going those athletes seem to have uh, the easiest time making weight and um, never seem to have any issues uh, like missing weight or anything like that never reported feeling flat during fights never thought that it was a bad weight cut that was responsible for for losing and so on um now that said there's which way which direction that works in was it because they were always focusing on their nutrition or is the type of athlete who stays focused on things all the time also paying attention to all the other details and is just more uh, dedicated in that fashion it's hard to tell but uh definitely from in terms of making weight um, and just how predictable we can map out, I think was the big thing, right? So the guys that were, would focus on things year round, what allowed us to do is we would have really solid data of, okay, we've worked together for the last four fights now. This is the timeline that we've kind of refined it to of, this is when we need to start the diet. This is how you respond to it. With this weight cut protocol, reliably, you're gonna drop this much weight in the final nine days, and then, we knew exactly that everything was gonna run smoothly. There was no guesswork. So there was no anxiety for the athlete going into that final week, even if they had quite a lot of kilos to go because we had such consistent data and followed the exact same thing. 
for the guys that would fluctuate all over the place, it's much more difficult to make a plan like that. So I, I do think that anecdotally, I've, I've seen that correlation between people who are paying that attention year round. Um, uh, so it, and, and that kind of also would fit my, my bias for it being important, but I would find it hard for someone to make a case that it's not beneficial. To be honest, I, I don't see how someone could uh, advocate for that. Yeah, and I guess as well, it helps your practice as well. I know Carl said on the first episode about that he doesn't mind helping people maybe one week out for a fight, which I completely understand and because they're going to maybe cut weight dangerously. And if there's a way that they can do it better with, with quick fire sort of short-term help, then sort of all for it. But I guess from my perspective and your perspective, allowing that almost yearly period of time, it means you get to bond with the athlete on a personal level. And you just said there about knowing how many calories they may need for maintenance, um, what foods they like, what foods they don't like, how they respond to different weight cut strategies. It just gives you more time, doesn't it? To just get to know mm. them as a person as well and get to know their body and what they respond to and, and stuff. Yeah, and I, on that note, I found it, it's very useful for the occasions where someone is taking a short notice fight, right? I've, I've had it with athletes that I work with consistently and have built that bond with, like you say, and have a lot of data collected on and we know how they respond to, to dieting. And so if they come to me and say, I've been offered a fight, it's in four weeks time, but here's my current body weight. Do you think we can do this? It's much easier to be able to think, yeah, we can do this or no, this is too far away. Whereas if someone that I haven't heard from in, uh, since the last time they had a fight and now their weight is incredibly high and they come to me four weeks out and say, I've been offered a fight at this uh, weight class. Uh, can we make it? Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know how we're going to respond to this because we haven't talked in a year. Um, and so you can attempt to do it, but it's based on a lot more guesswork because you just have less data to go on and you know that athlete, you don't know the athlete as well. And um so for that, it just decreases the stress from everyone all around. But I, I, I've certainly, as everyone, every practitioner I have, I've certainly had plenty of athletes who have been happy just to touch base when they've a fight coming up. Uh, some often that would not even do that when they have the fight coming up, but just wait until they start getting worried enough that they weren't going to make it with the way they were dieting themselves. And then suddenly you have three weeks to go and a major weight cut and, um, you, you get that text message. So I think most practitioners will unfortunately have to learn to live with that reality. Uh, but it just, it just, I mean, I mean, look, it's every athlete is, it's up to them. It's, it's their own way they want to conduct their career. You're just providing a service to them. So it's the onus is on how they choose to do it, but it's just unfortunate uh, because they're I think, essentially shortcutting or shortchanging themselves when they do that. Yeah. That's totally correct and saying that it is down to the, you said it's a lonely sport, but at the end of the day, it is down to the fighter, what they want to do and what, if they want to, you know, get a nutritionist support or they want to do extra S and C training outside of, of camp, that's completely on, you know, on their head and their decision to make, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not trying to advocate everyone needs to do it a certain way and to be successful, you need to take this approach or you need to go with what I'm doing. Like, there's so many guys that are just super talented and they have a routine that works for them and they do weight cutting practices that I, I personally wouldn't be doing with them, but they, that's just the way they like doing stuff. And it seems to have worked. So who am I to tell them not to do it when some of these guys I know are legitimate world champions um, and sure, could they be better? Maybe, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm not preaching to anyone. Um, and I, I don't, I don't think that's the, the way to go. People, all fighters can choose what they want to do. And um, it's just hopefully more of them find a solution with someone who is, is helping them make weight in the right way uh, because there's enough people out there doing it with either ineffective methods or more so dangerous methods um, that is not easy for a lot of athletes to distinguish that this person isn't credible. And so my hope is just that over time, we get more and more of a shift to them working with credible people as opposed to those that are um, kind of essentially playing like roulette with a lot of their, their, their fighters health. Um, and to this point, getting away with it. Yeah, exactly. And hopefully yeah, we will see a few, 
a few more people, um, you know, that are qualified helping these guys do it the right way. Um, I think the science is moving forward with everything, um, with the, the sort of facilities mm. and sports science stuff and recovery tools and stuff that fighters are mm. getting access to is, uh, you know, over the last two years, at least it has, you know, increased and they're, they're getting more access to it and becoming a bit more moving forward and moving away from the old school stuff in, in particularly in boxing. So yeah, hopefully these guys can get more mm. sort of, you know, credible nutrition support. Right. Yeah. And, and, but that's the thing, like you won't find a more dedicated uh, kind of athlete than someone that's competing in combat sports. So it's not a matter of dedication or not willing to work hard. In fact, in a lot of cases, it's the opposite that they're willing to sacrifice they too work much. too hard, don't they? Yeah. They, yeah. they end up eating hardly any calories or any carbohydrates. You know, it's a classic problem. So it's nothing to do with that. It's that they're putting their resources in the wrong place. And then, um, yeah, undermining what they're actually trying to do. So hopefully that continues to change as more and more good quality information gets out there. And yeah, fighters kind of take charge of, of what they want to do themselves. Brilliant stuff, Danny. You're going to wrap things up there. Before you go, I just want to ask you one question, which I'm going to ask all my guests. If you were to compete and walk to the ring, what would your ring walk song be? Put you on the spot there. Uh... Uh, depends if I wanted to go like super hyped up or just something real emotional. Super would, hyped up, super hyped up. I think maybe Can't Stop by Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh, it's something I've often used in uh, powerlifting meets for my final deadlift. So that's one that might trigger something. So maybe yeah, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Amazing, Danny. Great stuff. Look, if anybody wants to reach out to you or look at your, listen to your podcast or look at the stuff you do with Sigma Nutrition and the articles you put out, uh, where can people find you? Best place is just sigmanutrition.com. So S-I-G-M-A nutrition.com. Uh, and then they, if they're looking for specific stuff related to combat sports, uh, quite a lot of podcast episodes on that. You can, if you just search combat sports or boxing or whatever in, in the website, those should pop up. Um, I have a series of articles that are free to um, read as well, as well as the podcasts, which are free. And then for anyone that wants a bit more information, there's the uh, weight cutting system that, is available for sale on the website as well uh, which is easy to find there so that'll be a full digital book uh, and then it has like sample um, meal plans and so on to give people an idea of how we lay it out and it has a like a calculator of how we work out uh, fluid requirements and so on so um, that might be of interest to people but uh, yeah have a look around at sigmanutrition.com and if something's useful great and then just on social media, probably Instagram is the best place to get me. It's just Danny Lennon underscore Sigma. Wicked. Awesome stuff, Danny. Thank you for giving me up the time and uh, good chat. Yeah, thank you for having me, man. I'm really pleased that you asked me and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more of these future episodes that you're doing.